Monster Hunter as a series has moved away from its classic or old school roots for a while now. Some might say that Generations was the start of it, some might even say Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, but arguably the biggest shift in design decisions was the jump from 4th gen to 5th gen with the release of Monster Hunter World in 2018. When I first started making videos centered around Monster Hunter, I created one called Monster Hunter vs. The World that took a glance at the design differences between old school Monster Hunter and new school, and how I felt that a lot of those changes and simplifications were a detriment to the series as a whole. And honestly, my opinion hasn't really changed. There's a lot about the new generation of Monster Hunter that makes it feel like it's missing something that the older games offered, but that isn't going to be the point of this video. No, I already covered my thoughts on that, and discussing them again would just be me regurgitating opinions that I already know will make some of you pretty upset. Instead, I want to focus on Rise as an evolution of not Monster Hunter as a whole, but of Monster Hunter World specifically. Considering how different Generation 5 is from Generation 4, it'd be unfair to simply say that the older generations did it better and therefore this game isn't living up to what it could. Instead, we'll take a look at what the developers intended as a successor to World within the fifth generation of games, see what they may have brought back from the old school design philosophies, and consider what could have been done better for the long run of this series' new direction. You can think of Rise as Monster Hunter World 1.5, or Monster Hunter World Portable, and that's thanks to the game's director Ichinose, who is the main face behind the portable series of games. His design style, decisions, and aesthetic for the series are some of my personal favorites and helps give us a glimpse of the old school mixed with the new school. Today I want to look at the major aspects of the game and what they brought to the table, for better or for worse. We'll look at new and old monster inclusions and how they've changed in this entry, as well as other additions, changes, and returning mechanics. Again, I want to be very clear, while we will be discussing aspects of old school games, I'll really be looking at Rise under the lens of of fifth generation specifically. And before we get started, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. YouTube still has my family held hostage, and I am currently burrowing down to the center of the planet to reach their headquarters so I can face off against Susan in a Yu-Gi-Oh match and bring my family back from the shadow algorithm realm. Anyway, I'm Super Ed, and this is the Monster Hunter Rise Review. The big issue for players who started in World is the release of Rise being a Switch exclusive, at least for a year until its PC release. I don't want to dwell on this topic for too long because Monster Hunter is a game more about the pure gameplay than anything else I've ever played. Graphics are nice, but as long as it runs at a steady frame rate and I'm able to make out what I'm looking at, I don't have any issues. However, there are small performance issues here and there. Mostly when hunting with four other people, you'll sometimes notice frame drops when there's a lot going on on the screen, but it's hardly noticeable and negligible otherwise. The RE engine really is magic, and helps bring a level of detail to the game that many probably thought wasn't possible on the Switch. The game is a big contender visually with releases like Breath of the Wild, and the particle effects are brand new and beautiful to see. Monster flame attacks or beams especially have a new visual look to them that's fantastic and has this cell shaded fluid look to it. Running on the Switch, the game is fuzzy at times, and that's the best way I can describe it. It just feels a bit fuzzy to me, and the aliasing is very apparent on larger screens. The biggest thing holding the game back is the frame rate being locked to 30 FPS, but this will most likely not be a factor in the PC release. The only reason I even care about the frame rate is because it ties directly into the fidelity of the game. All I can really say about the game being on the Switch is that I wish it was a little clearer and a higher frame rate specifically for gameplay purposes. Despite this, it's still a beautiful, colorful experience. Speaking of gameplay, let's go over all of the changes and inclusions found in Monster Hunter Rise. The biggest inclusion is definitely the wire bug, which now also ties directly into the map design. With the wire bug, hunters have a slew of new mobility options and make it much easier to move around, and maps have been simplified from World to make better use of the new mechanic. This is a huge plus for me. One of my biggest issues with World was the overly convoluted map design and how they used a modernized mini-map that didn't provide enough detail for navigation, thus forcing you to open up your main map and stop you in your tracks in order to figure out where the hell you actually were. Now maps are much more open and generally flatter, with large cliff sides scattered throughout. While individual zones haven't marked their return necessarily, the design of the entire map is shown on the screen, and it's much easier for a player to figure out where the hell they're going. The verticality of the maps comes from the large cliff sides that the hunters can now climb up and jump off of no matter what type of surface it is. Similar to how Monster Hunter 4 revolutionized climbing and verticality in Generation 4, Rise has taken it a step further with the wire bug and made it possible to climb virtually anything. And within that, encourage this form of traversal by adding in little bonuses like endemic life, birds that give you stat boosts, and little 
secrets all around. It's a very simplified process that meshes well with this heightened mobility, and has breathed fresh air into the design of each area, allowing them to really shine and prevent players from getting lost. On the wirebug specifically, this really changes how hunters interact with monsters in a hunt. The ability to be much more aggressive and mobile leads to a faster paced gameplay experience and is something we were introduced to in World with the Slinger, but is greatly expanded upon here, being able to be used anywhere and at any time as long as you have the wirebugs to do so, which charge over time. But its mobility isn't overpowered. Generally when fighting a monster, you'll use what's known as the wirefall mechanic to catch yourself after being launched by an attack. This is a great way to escape danger, but can be detrimental if abused. Most monsters have the ability to attack in succession, and by wire falling, you are ending any recovery or invincibility frames you have which would generally lead to safety. You can find yourself being attacked, wire falling afterwards, and launching yourself into another immediate attack. This is something I'm notoriously good at achieving and have seen multiple carts because of this. This means you have to get used to and good at the mechanic, and can be punished for not doing so, something that's always great to see in these types of games as they encourage you to practice and get better. Traversing with the wirebug is also incredibly satisfying. Once used to the mechanic, you'll find yourself able to scale any cliffside with ease and even cross incredibly large gaps, making map traversal so much more fun and engaging than it has been in any game. It really is a great experience, and my only issue with it is that it's a gimmick we will probably never see again in future releases. While Monster Hunter 4 revolutionized the state of the game with its verticality, it feels like Rise does something similar, but without as much of an impact. It's fun, but it feels like it's an extra extra mechanic just tacked on, and if the release of Monhun games are anything to look at, we usually lose extra mechanics like this in the next release with them, you know, maybe returning in some capacity in further releases. Just keep them in, Capcom. If you have something good, keep it in and try to build off of it. Please, but not underwater fighting. Keep that dead and buried. Thank you. Seriously though, I loved this mechanic. The mobility and options you have feel so much more fluid than World, and they even tie into the next major mechanic, which is essentially recycled from Monster Hunter Generations, the Silkbind attacks. Each weapon gets access to three Silkbind attacks, most of which are essentially Hunter R's from Generations. These were always incredibly satisfying mechanics to use within Generations, but would often require a large amount of buildup to make use of. Now instead, you simply need to wait for a wirebug to recharge and then the sky's the limit. Some abilities only require one wirebug to use, while others require two. The main issue with this is that it seems like Capcom had no idea whatsoever how to balance the cost of abilities. Take Sakura Slash for example. This ability is a high damage, highly mobile move that on top of repeated hits which are great for status or elemental weapons will also automatically raise your spirit gauge level by one if the attack connects. That costs one wire bug, meaning if you grab an extra one you can be in red gauge and have dealt an incredibly large amount of damage right at the beginning of the hunt. Compare that to the counter silk bind move Serene Pose, it will allow you to completely counter and negate the damage of an attack, but also lowers your spirit gauge level by one and costs two wire bugs. I honestly never found myself using this ability, and especially for casual play, found spamming Sakura Slash to be incredibly effective. These balancing issues might be something we see fixed in future updates, but at the moment, some abilities for some weapons are so phenomenally busted. It's actually surprising. While I love Longsword and I got that unga bunga brain, it manages to be leaps and bounds more effective than most weapon options in the game and kind of feels boring because of that. That being said, the abilities remain satisfying to use. When an attack like Sakura Slash or Helm Splitter connects, the good chemicals begin to flow in my brain and keep me engaged. While I didn't see it as a fault too much, there are less options for which abilities you can slot in than in Generations Ultimate. It didn't bother me too much, but there are many cool hunter arts in Generations Ultimate and I hope we at least begin to see them show up in future updates. At the moment, weapons start with two Silk Bind abilities and only one of them can be swapped out for an extra attack, like Soaring Kick being swapped out for Sakura Slash. This may have been for balancing reasons, as being able to use Sakura Slash and Soaring Kick in conjunction would have broken the game with the amount of consistent brain dead damage possible. I also really appreciated the switch skills where certain base moves that may be the key to your combo can be swapped out for newer returning abilities. I'll use Longsword as an example because it's my main and I'm too unga bunga brain to actually learn anything else. It can swap its draw attack out for a double slash attack that seems to have incredibly high motion values and has virtually no downside outside of not being able to fade slash after it. And you can swap out your traditional spirit combo for the valor combo seen in Generations Ultimate. It can't counter, 
but does inflict high damage and in my opinion it is much more useful when you want to hit the monster's head or tail that may be a bit too high for the normal attack. All the weapons have this ability to swap out two traditional moves for new ones and it really helps boost the customizability and replayability of certain weapons. While I feel like there are some abilities for some weapons that are notoriously better in comparison to the other options for them, some of these weapons might find that different abilities work in different scenarios. Adding on to the mobility aspect is the inclusion of a new type of companion, the Palamute. While Monster Hunter Try and 3 you removed Palicos and replaced them with Shakalakas, potentially one of the greatest decisions they ever made in the series, since Cha-Cha and Kayamba are goaded homies that will never do you any wrong except potentially throwing feline bombs at you consistently in a hunt. Instead of replacing Palicos, they now exist in conjunction with Palamutes, and hunters can decide whether or not they want to bring one of each or two of either selection. Within battle, Palicos probably still offer the most functionality in terms of assistance. They're great for setting extra traps, throwing flash bombs, and much more. But where Palamutes shine is in their mobility. Now, the hunter has the ability to ride Palamutes. It's not only much faster to get around the map, but it heightens mobility when using items as well, and I love this. As soon as the monster runs off, I can hop on my Palamute and chase it down, but while doing so, I can sharpen my weapon, which is just such a godsend when you want to maximize DPS. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, super rad, that sounds pretty pretty hypocritical coming from you. Didn't you absolutely destroy Monster Hunter World for being overly aggressive? Isn't that what Rise is doing here? And if you did say that, Fuck you. But you're also right. I did do that. But I did it within a criticism of world in comparison to older games. If we're just going to keep moving forward with this gameplay style, I'd rather praise Rise for doing it better than dwell on the fact that I'm not playing an old school Monster Hunter game. I can do that at any time anyway over on Twitter and cause drama within the community by talking about how much better Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate is in comparison to any other game in the series, don't at me. Anyway, Palamutes are a great addition and I found myself always bringing one with me into multiplayer hunts so I could get around easier. That being said, Palicos Online are also highly viable as you can still fast travel to multiple base camps in this game and use wirebugs to increase your mobility around the map. What's that? You can bring Palicos and Palamutes into multiplayer hunts regardless of the sizes of the party? It's new to this game and honestly makes multiplayer matches an unbelievable mess. Four players plus four companions on a single hunt is absolutely disgusting to look at and makes it almost impossible to actually tell what's going on in a hunt due to all the effects and mechanics taking place at the same time. I believe you can turn these off entirely to make it more bearable, but even then, there's just so many objects on the screen it's distracting. I honestly have more fun soloing content in this game in comparison to multiplayer hunts because at least then I can actually learn the mechanics and see what the monster is about to do. God damn Capcom, just tone it down a smidge for us so we aren't all just button mashing silkbind attacks against an innocent great Azuki who is getting demolished by a bunch of hunters drunk on dongos and lusting for blood. Oh yeah, I think I mentioned this previously but all of this happening at once can lead to some frame drops but nothing too egregious. The core gameplay of the hunt without all of the frills of wirebug and hunter arts or switch skills, etc. is basically what you would expect from base world. Most weapons retain their mechanics from world and may see some new inclusions or returning elements from previous generations, like the bow which has different shot types based on charge levels again. Another new aspect of the game, one I immediately turned off, was the ability for hunters to talk while out on a hunt. I found this incredibly grating even when playing in Monster Hunter language and ended up turning it either off or barely present. Now onto monsters, there's a lot of cool new additions to the series and they're all based on yokai from Japanese folklore leading to some pretty unique designs which was great to see. Even monsters like the new bird wyvern inclusion Aknasom really impressed me in their design. It was a beautiful and elegant monster that you would still absolutely bully and ruin by the end of the hunt. It really did look like it had the absolute shit kicked out of it by the end and I love watching this as I progressed. And believe me, when I say you will absolutely be bullying the life out of these monsters, the added mobility and abusable ability abilities for hunters make this one of the easiest Monster Hunter games I have ever played. And this isn't just from me being an experienced hunter, because I'm ass at these games in comparison to some people. I can still run over to 3 Ultimate and get my teeth kicked in. No, this game is seriously easy, to the point that it's boring. I found myself in any hunt without any real need to focus on the monster's mechanics or telegraphs because I could zip around them at high speed and follow up with attacks that would flinch them more often than not, often locking monsters into a cycle where I just ravage them for around 5-10 to 10 minutes until they're dead. And that's another issue with these monsters. You have no real reason to learn their movesets too much except for maybe Almadron who is so notoriously unique in its moves that the player base can't decide if they love him or hate him. 
you're going to be experiencing incredibly short hunts that last less than 10 minutes, and the only thing you're going to get out of it is a ton of plates and gems because the loot tables seem to be even more forgiving in this entry than what I'm generally used to. Even though I looked at the hunter notes and they seem to be similar in past games. It's lacking a sense of accomplishment and very few monsters get to shine in this game which is really sad because a lot of them have some pretty cool mechanics. Somnicanth, for example can pull up shells from the water for various effects, even making it one of the only monsters currently that can apply blast ailment. And Magnamalo is just so amazing in its design and moveset and so incredibly mobile and aggressive that it helps to match the mobility and abilities of the hunters so it can actually stand up to them. It even gets combo maneuvers pulled directly from Monster Hunter Frontiers Eruzarian, just showing how absolutely bonkers and unique this monster gets to be in comparison to the rest of the cast. But again, this is the exception and definitely not the rule. Almost every other monster is going to let you bully the ever-loving fuck out of it, with only a few actually getting to shine. Rachna Kadaki is another example of an amazing fight and one I really loved learning the mechanics of. It's really sad and I hope we see an improvement to this in some way when the inevitable G rank expansion gets released. Even worse, some of the monsters with more unique mechanics, Apex monsters, are currently locked behind what I consider to be one of the least fun and annoying siege mechanics Capcom has ever introduced to the series, Rampages. And these aren't things that you can just simply do on the side like the actually good sieges, I'm looking at Gen Moran or other old school monsters. No, you have to repeat these glorified tower defenses at least three to four times to make it through all of the content and more if you want to get to their specific equipment. The big issue is that Rampages are a convoluted mess that never really require you to do anything you normally would as a hunter, except for when the counter signal is activated, then next thing you know you're dealing 10 times the damage but also fighting 10 times the monsters in a glorified mosh pit at the world's most hectic concert. If you thought 4 player hunts were a mess, wait until you're in a 4 player rampage with a counter signal and the apex finally shows up. It is just such a missed opportunity because these apex monsters are essentially the deviant version of existing monsters from Monster Hunter Generations and the mechanics they bring from that entry can't be fully appreciated while in a rampage. Hopefully with title updates and events we'll get to fight these monsters on normal maps with normal mechanics or at the very least within the arena. Seriously, I cannot stress enough how unfun I found rampages to be. They're silly and energetic and there is some appeal there, but having to grind them in any capacity is such a chore in comparison to the rest of the game and I really hope that they don't reintroduce them. It's so sad because the traditional siege fight against Gen Moran would have been so much fun with the wirebug mechanic if they reworked it slightly. I was so disappointed to see that they could have taken that route and instead decided on the tower defense mechanic. It's actually garbage Capcom. Come on, please, what are you doing? Another thing, they even added a new icon that tells you when the monster is capturable, and if that isn't so egregiously anti-monster hunter, I don't know what is. You know, when damage numbers were introduced, it was one thing. At least monster health pools were dynamic, and you know, big numbers make the brain chemicals go zoom. So I could take it or leave it. But to basically show you that the hunt was over outside of the monster limping, a tell that you would look for in any other entry is absolutely atrocious. I think something similar may have been in World, but I don't remember it being this blatant. It's one step away from adding a health bar, and I honestly can't wait for them to do that so I can criticize it and have someone in the comments call me a boomer for disliking it. One other thing about monsters that I found a bit weird was how they tried to include invading species. For example, Rajang can appear in a map later on in the game and you'd expect it to actively show up near you and mess with you in the hunt, but this isn't the case. If anything, it will stay off in the corner somewhere and never bother you. And if it does show up, it's a bonus if anything, because you can easily mount it and use it to produce a boatload of damage, and then once it's finished, it'll just run off again and you'll probably complete the quest before seeing it anymore. I feel like they should find a way to make these invading monsters more of a threat and more aggressive. If anything, they shouldn't be mountable. Now on the topic of wyvern riding and mounting, I actually really enjoy its inclusion. It's very easy to deal damage to whatever monster you're hunting when mounting another, and it leads to great openings for you and your party of hunters. And if you're riding the target monster, you can still get a lot of damage in by bashing its frail head into the wall up to three to four times. It's decently rewarding and feels more engaging within a hunt in comparison to simply mashing triangle until the monster falls over. The issue with wyvern riding lies in the fact that you may not want to activate it, but it's a buildup of silkbind attack damage that triggers it. So you may find yourself being forced to ride the monster and have to either quickly knock yourself off and deal no extra damage or run around the map for a bit and get in multiple head bashes against some walls and cause it down. I think in the future it'd be 
smart to add something similar to World that effectively acts as the hunter attacking the monster while riding it with some big motion value that will quickly down it and allow players to get back into the core of the hunt. Overall it's a fun and interesting mechanic, I just think a few tweaks here and there will really make it shine. Monster Hunter World removed the distinction between village and hub quests, meaning any quest in the game could be picked up either solo or multiplayer with a drop in SOS mechanic. Rise marks the return of this distinction, but hub quests can still be played solo thanks to the fact that they scale based on how many people are within the hunt at the time. So HP pools are dynamic and can change as hunters drop in or out. I honestly don't know how I feel about it. I'm definitely happy to have hub quests back, but making them so easily soloable makes it even easier to breeze through this game. Village quests are specific terribly easy and you'd expect to see the real challenge in hub. What made hub difficult and engaging in the old days was that everything was scaled for 3 to 4 players, so you have to either get really good or form a group, and it feels like that aspect of the game is still missing. However, it is more accessible for players that want to experience all of the content without a group and there's definitely some merit for that. Completing quests is also incredibly unrewarding. I don't want to talk about the merits of the storyline too much because honestly Monster Hunter has rarely if ever been about the story. I am a firm believer that the game should be judged based on content, rewards, and gameplay, and while storyline is a factor, it's a small one if anything. So when I say that the story is hardly if ever engaging and doesn't really lead anywhere interesting, it's not really a shot at the game as a whole. Most Monster Hunter games have a poor storyline. The issue lies in how the progress is presented. This might be the most controversial topic of the video, but it really feels like the game was half finished and that we haven't received a full product. Before you go telling me that you squeezed 100 plus hours out of this game, the longevity of it is isn't what I am criticizing. You could have an unfinished game last 500 hours, but it may still be missing content that should have been in at the start. Let's talk about the progression of village quests. The entire concept is meant to be an introduction to Rampages and Magnamalo, and I want to compare this progression to Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. In 3 Ultimate, as you progress through the story, you didn't just simply hear about Lagaya Cruz and see it in cutscenes. You would actually run into the monster in the field before you were ready and have to escape from it to hunt another day. There was a feeling of anxiety and engagement and progression that really showed how strong you became by the time you were ready to hunt it. In comparison, we have the village structure for Rise, where you hunt a bunch of easy monsters leading up to the rampage, then after the rampage you get one cutscene that actually has you engage with Magnamalo. And there's no gameplay involved in this. They don't even let you attempt to repel the monster. Instead you escape via a cutscene and have to unlock the next urgin in order to hunt it properly. There's no real build up here and while the Magnamalo hunt itself is very enjoyable, it is a very unrewarding progression experience and once completed you don't really get anything out of it other than the realization that you need to move on to hub quests. Monster Hunter does this thing usually, where when you complete every quest available to you, even non-key quests, you again get some sort of reward. Maybe it's rainbow pigment, maybe it's a special advanced quest like unlocking Alatreon for completing all village quests in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. There's usually something and it is incredibly rewarding. Getting to complete Mark of a Hero and other challenging quests as rewards for all of the grinding you put in feels good and Rise just doesn't offer you that at all. It doesn't even offer you that for completing every hub quest, and this is why I feel like the game is half finished. It feels like some of these title updates that we are going to be getting in April should have been in the game from the get-go, and completing all of the content there would have rewarded us with various things. Hell, even HR Cap isn't in the base game. We have to wait for a title update to get one of the main grinding aspects we see in every Monster Hunter experience. It just makes a large chunk of the game feel like it's empty or missing, and I found myself putting the controller down for Rise much faster than I have for any other game in the series, even World. And hunts are, again, just so incredibly fast. I found pretty much every hunt being completed in sub 10 minute runs, whether that be solo or with a group. And say what you will about World's story, but at least it felt like a complete experience with a definitive end by the time you reached Xenogiva. The same can't be said for Rise in any capacity. One cool aspect about the quest in Rise is that there are more key quests available to you than you need to complete, meaning you can now pick and choose which quests you want to tackle over others in order to progress in the game. I really enjoyed this specific inclusion and hope to see it return in future releases. On a more positive note, the village and characters of Monster Hunter Rise are some of the most enjoyable in the series. The village of Kimura specifically is highly detailed and has a lot to offer without being overbearing, and the loading times and quick travel is actually really quick. 
Monster Hunter World suffered from Astera being a bit too big and hard to get around in my opinion, especially on the PS4 where the load times were absolutely atrocious. Again, the RE engine is magic. Loading times are fantastic, and you can fast travel from anywhere at any time. Even when in a multiplayer lobby, the entire village is explorable for both you and your party members. The village itself really gets the vibe of Monster Hunter. It almost feels like you're revisiting Poke Village, or more closely, Yakumo Village from Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, and the music that plays throughout is beautiful. I often found myself simply vibing in and around the village, and even had characters wave to me and say hello. I loved it, and I feel like a big aspect of why it was so good was Ichinose. The man is probably the most effective at creating Monster Hunter vibes, even in new gen content. Farming is basically an improved version of what we saw in 3 Ultimate. Similar to that game, you can select an item that has been in your inventory and ask to have it produced over a period of time at the cost of Kimura points. For additional points, you can upgrade the process and have it either be quicker, offer better amounts of materials, or various other bonuses depending on the level of Palamute or Palico you send off to deal with it. It's much better than the farm in 3U due to the fact that you don't need to sacrifice an item to begin farming it. As long as you have the item at one point in the past, you can ask to have it generated for you, and bonuses are no longer tied to special items that you need to farm through the Argozi Captain and are strictly tied to the companion level and the Kimura point cost. It's streamlined in the best way and makes farming items so much more efficient. Hell, you can even trade with Rondine for Pale Extract sometimes, meaning making Mega Demon Drug and Mega Armor skins is easier than ever and that was one of the grinds I really hated in the older games. One of the last things I really want to touch on is equipment. Weapon designs in World were incredibly bland and used slap-on designs that were interchangeable throughout multiple trees. It removed a lot of the character from weapons and made progression feel stale. Rice keeps these weapons for monsters that were introduced in World, but brings new unique designs we have come to expect from previous entries into the mix for either returning monsters or new monsters. Seriously, a lot of the designs are fantastic and unique, and getting designs like the Mizutsune Longsword back in an entry is such a blessing because it's one of my favorite weapons in the history of the series. There's even at least one joke design for each weapon like the Origami Switch Axe or the Anteka Longsword. Unfortunately, balancing issues still seem to be a big issue. While there are many branching trees for each weapon, from my experience there are generally only one or two actually worth using in the end. There is no elemental weapon worth using over the Nargakuga Longsword aside from maybe the blast weapon you can get from the Magnamalo tree, but I haven't looked into the numbers specifically so this may not be completely accurate. Armor designs are fantastic and unique and offer you useful armor skills from the get-go. You can easily make functional sets within low rank that can carry you throughout the majority of high rank and then create even better, more effective sets from there thanks to better armor pieces, as well as the reintroduction of decorations and charms. Now these things were in world, but within that entry hunters would craft charms and have to randomly get every single decoration for a large number of slots. Now it's back to the ways of old school and hunters can craft decorations and meld monster parts to try and pull for randomized charms, and while these charms are great for maximizing the most out of your set, they are hardly necessary and you can make something fantastic without them, meaning there's less of a necessity to grind for them and they act as a bit of a bonus if anything. The main thing holding decorations back is that many of them are locked until you have completed every possible rank of the game and even then, there are many skills that don't have decorations at all. If you did plan on grinding for them, they are specifically designed to just make you as powerful as possible now that you've reached the non-existent endgame of Rise. Essentially, some of your options are artificially limited instead of how it was in previous games where the sky was the limit. If you could craft it and fit it into your available slots, go for it. Now it's more like there's a sparse selection of decorations and it becomes pretty obvious what everybody is going to be slotting in. It's less creative. But don't worry, you're going to have plenty of different sets and weapons to choose from because the armor and weapon grind in this game barely exists. They made the cost of creating equipment much more lenient in this game, but on top of that, the drops from monsters seem to be even more lenient as well. By simply playing through village and hub quests up to HR7, I pretty much had everything I needed to complete over half the longsword weapon tree and never found myself needing to take too much active time to make the weapons I wanted. The game hands out drops like candy all in the name of cutting down on the main grind of Monster Hunter that keeps us coming back and that's disappointing to me. But what's weird to me is that if you look at the drop rates, as I said previously, something like a plate and an orb are what you would expect them to be percentage wise, so why exactly do rare drops seem so common? There's gotta be something I'm missing here. There is no real endgame in Rise, but I don't think there really was any in World either. Instead, you're 
expected to grind for min-maxing armor skills and finishing any set you want until the next title update comes out. That's fine as it causes players to return to the game at regular intervals, but it leaves a bit of downtime in between. The nice thing about some of the previous games was that even after you completed the core content, you'd be offered advanced content to really test your limits and give you an excuse to actually make these crazy meta sets. Unfortunately, Rise just feels like a gacha simulator by the end as you're mostly going to be farming the final boss for monster parts in order to melt talismans until you get some sort of amazing talisman that will help boost your set to godhood. I may not have covered every single aspect of this game within the review, but I think I covered enough to give you a good idea of my opinion on the game as a whole and also give longtime and new Monster Hunter fans enough insight on whether or not this game lives up to the title within the series. And I think it does live up that is. I think Rise progressed with what World introduced but brought with it some great old school design choices that helped breathe some new life into the series for fans that may have been playing for years and years. Unfortunately, I think the game falters in a couple of ways, mostly through the ease of progression and the lack of accomplishment for making it to the end. It feels like an incomplete experience, and that's not because of the title updates. World felt like a complete experience and offered us extra content. Rise feels like it was rushed out and missing something that should have been in from the get go. Seriously, I bet if they waited until the end of April to release the game, it would have felt like the whole package. That being said, I had a lot of fun with this game despite the hiccups. I enjoyed playing with my friends and community members, I enjoyed talking about the game, I enjoyed the aesthetic, I enjoyed seeing monsters return and be redesigned to be more engaging than they ever had. Rise has so much potential and even if this was a rocky start, I feel like it's understandable considering the climate of our world at the moment with a global pandemic going on, and I honestly only see the final product becoming better over time with these updates and the inevitable expansion. Rise can be great and can become one of the best entries in the series, but as of writing this, it's nowhere near that yet. I'm eager to see what it looks like in the future and my fingers are crossed that it's something fantastic. This comes from someone that grew up with the series and loves it. Monster Hunter is a huge aspect of my life, especially now, and I want to see it succeed. Just kidding, it's a garbage poo-poo game for little babies, and I rank it 3.5 low rank kezus out of 10. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. You made it to the Patreon aspect of it where I shout some people out and there should be subtitles or credits somewhere around here. I'm not completely sure. Anyway, thank you guys so much for supporting the channel, supporting Twitch, and just supporting me by watching either like just through views or financially. It's amazing. Uh, I got some people that have gone above and beyond that I want to shout out here as is the G rank tier of Patreon. So let's get right into it. Uh, Cyberworm, thank you so much for the G rank tier of uh, uh, pledge i really appreciate it i hope you're having a great day cody rome thank you so much i appreciate it loose tall goose thanks so much for the g rank tier kathleen medjuk thank you so much i really appreciate it uh really appreciate the support crunchy kauru not uh, not crunchy brown another crunchy that i know but crunchy kauru thank you so much for the g rank tier Keyroy, appreciate it hope you're having a great day you're, you're balling you're faded jonathan Amazing, thank you. Strange Lee, big supporter of the channel, huge supporter of the channel. Thank you so much as always. Ben VB, appreciate it, man. Hope you're having a great day. Lude Hafumi, thank you so much. I hope you are also having a great day. Hope it's, it's cold here. It's cold here, but hopefully you're having a great day. Rosa Leo, another great, uh, actually, if you saw in the video, we had like a new uh, fan art of me being used in it, and that was done by Rosalio. So appreciate it and appreciate the pledge. Thank you so much. Justin Ragel. I, I think I'm saying that right, Justin. And if I'm not, I'm sorry, but thank you so much for the pledge. I really appreciate it. I hope you're having a great day. Kepler, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it, Kepler, but I uh, really hope that you have a great day. I, ho I hope it's so awesome. Hope to see you in the Discord and all that good stuff. Mr. Janky, my friend, my good friend, and my uh, currently one of my main mods of the community uh really appreciate uh the pledge thank you so much it's amazing and i uh, hope you're having a great day man hope snips is having a great day as well and uh that's everybody if you want to be shouted out in the next video check out uh the patreon which will be linked below check out twitch because i'm streaming regularly check out the discord and all that and please consider liking commenting and subscribing if you like this video and you want to see more please consider coming back and checking out the rest of the content thanks so much everyone and i will see you in the next video. Bye. Uh -huh.